Hello, and welcome to Project Mira. In the last episode, we briefly went over Mira's statistics as well as its celestial family. We then went on to discover what early ocean life may have looked like. Today, we will be exploring the ocean further. Voskostoma may evolve again, favoring the open ocean and the bountiful amounts of plankton that come with it. This time, it may develop thin teeth within its mouth to filter out unwanted animals, and its mandibles may form a net between them to catch more prey. This is known as filter feeding. Some animals on Earth, such as whales and certain types of sharks, have evolved this method of consuming food, so it's reasonable to assume that these creatures would as well. Because of their feeding habits, they may grow to be quite large, nearly 2 meters in size. This will create a need for an endoskeleton, as the creature's mass will require it for its muscles to anchor to, as well as for structural support. An endoskeleton is a bony structure that resides within a creature for previously mentioned reasons. Last time, I did not mention that Voskostoma may have begun development on an endoskeleton for the same reason. It grew large and needed structural support. This endoskeleton would have been very basic, however, and would have consisted of a small skull-like shape near the eyes and a basic spinal column. Not including the head, there are seven segments because of its original body plan, the septosoma. In this new creature, the skull structure is more developed and its segments have been multiplied to allow for better support and flexibility. Basic ribs have begun to form as well, protecting the innards. As you can see from the diagram, the heart has grown quite large. This is also due to the size of the creature, as a greater mass requires much more blood to be pushed throughout the body. Its stomach and intestinal tract are large as well. Because of the amount of food it eats, it has developed a larger stomach to contain more food. With so much food, it may need help digesting. For this reason, it may develop an acid that will break down the food. Its through gut may begin to spiral slightly towards the back, to allow for a longer digestive period. This creature may live to be 20 years old, and will reproduce sexually by locking fins together and mating to exchange gametes. This creature will be named Tropolophagus, or eater of many foods. Traumastoma may be too small to continue feeding on Tropolophagus, but it may evolve to feed on this new food source in a different way, by becoming smaller. This minuscule creature will start out meaning well, eating any bits of algae on the body of Tropolophagus. But Traumastoma has a ferocious appetite, and as such, this smaller form may take to biting small pieces of meat off of Tropolophagus. This may further develop into parasitism, where the creature latches onto the host and slowly leeches blood. Traumastoma's long, piercing mandibles will be perfect for attaching itself to a host. Tropolophagus will likely feel nothing more than a slight itch, as the parasite will develop an anesthetic and an anticoagulant in its saliva. This will prevent the Tropolophagus from detecting the parasite, and it will allow for uninterrupted feeding. To help find its prey, the creature may adapt to have electroreception, a development found in sharks, platypuses, and other animals on Earth. This will allow it to find Tropolophagus quite easily. The parasite may evolve into multiple different species, feeding on just about any creature larger than itself. This creature may live up to five years. We will call this creature Microtraumastoma, or Small Traumastoma. When Tropolophagus dies, it will leave a nutritious bounty of remains behind. Traumastoma may evolve to specialize in consuming the carcasses of Tropolophagus to fill the role of carrion eater. This new creature will have club-like mandibles, which will be adept at crushing bones. It may also develop a bony lower jaw, allowing for bones to further be crushed. Having a bony lower jaw will also allow the creature to push water into its mouth and through its gills without having to move forward. 
This will allow the creature to stop and eat without having to swim around to get oxygen. Within its gut, the creature may develop powerful stomach acid to dissolve its meal before sending it to its intestines, where the nutrients will be absorbed. Because it feeds on Tropolophagus, it may grow to be fairly sizable, and may live 15 to 17 years. This creature will be known as Leshostoma, or club mouth. Before we move on to the deep, I'd like to discuss, however briefly, the evolution in plant life along the shore. If its bulb were to grow too dense, Astrophilus may sink to the ocean floor. With such dense and nutritious fibers, it may instead evolve to stay on the ocean floor, growing thick roots to secure itself onto the sediment. Being fully submerged, it may develop sex organs between its five leaves, allowing it to disperse and propagate more efficiently. The female's sex organ will be long stalks, and the male will be smaller stalks surrounding it. When it comes time to reproduce, generally during Mira's long and hot summers, the plant will send out its spores into the ocean, where they will collide with one another and form offspring. The offspring will float along the ocean currents until it finds a suitable location, where it will then root itself and begin the cycle again. Voscostoma and Schizomabracid may forage for food in these new forests that populate the shallows of the ocean. This plant shall be called Rhizophilus, or rooted plant. The offspring of Rhizophilus may accidentally land on other Rhizophilus or even Astrophilus. Instead of waiting for the current to take it elsewhere, it may root itself in the plant-like material. It may not grow to be very large, but as a new parasitic plant, it will be a danger to the ecosystem. This parasite will devour the nutrients provided by Rhizophilus, and if the numbers are too great, the forest may disappear. This life form will be known as Malophilus, or evil plant. To combat the terror that is Malophilus, a familiar creature may adapt to cleanse Rhizophilus of its parasitic plague. Panoplosoma, a sessile creature, may evolve to be motile. Its shell may spiral to allow for a longer body within a compact space, and two of its tentacles may specialize to have eyes at the end of them. Its eyes did not begin at the end of its tentacles, however, instead starting at the base near its body. Over time, these rudimentary photoreceptors move to the ends, allowing for greater detection of predators. All of its tentacles can be retracted into its shell in case danger approaches. Within its shell, there is a small amount of space between the creature's body and its shell to allow for proper expanse and contraction. It may be beneficial for the creature to develop sexual organs. Once again, the female will produce eggs while the male provides the necessary components to create offspring. Due to restricted space within its shell, the creature may only produce a small amount of offspring. This will cause a need for parental care, as it will not have the plethora of children needed to offset the low survival rate. When mating, the male will dig a burrow under the roots of Rhizophilus. If the burrow is suitable, the female will mate. She will remain within the burrow when the eggs are ready to be laid, and will protect her small clutch until they are ready to live on their own. For this reason, it may be beneficial for females to have a venomous claw at the end of her front tentacles. During the time in which the offspring is growing, the female will consume much more food, bringing it back to her young and depositing the half-digested meal into their mouths. Since feeding a clutch of offspring takes a lot of food and energy, the female may add to her diet, eating any detritus she may find along the way. After her young have grown enough to survive on their own, she will leave the burrow and continue to reproduce until she dies, living a life of 10 years. We will call this creature Caliphosoma, for its shell body. But Caliphosoma will not be without predators. Dinkanabrachid may develop longer legs to allow it to move faster along the ocean floor, and its predatory claws may become jagged to allow it to pull Caliphosoma out of its shell. Its eyes may further specialize for predatory habits, with the front two becoming better at detecting movement, and the top two being relegated to sensing predators. The exoskeleton may develop a sandy pigment to allow it to camouflage itself in its habitat. 
This creature may live to eight years. This creature will be called Tachypod, or Swift Foot. Leshistoma may evolve to be a suitable predator for Tachypod, as its bone-crushing mandibles would be perfect for crushing Tachypod exoskeletons. Its club mandibles may shorten as they are no longer needed to crush bone. Beyond that, this creature will be largely similar to Leshistoma, and as such will live up to 15 years. This creature will be known as Tachypodophagus, or Eater of Tachypods. Remember the parasitic Microtraumastoma? Tripolophagus may seek help in getting rid of the pest, and so may swim to shallower waters. A likely candidate to cure Tripolophagus of its plague would be a descendant of the Tachypod. This creature will be slightly smaller than its ancestor, but will have developed crab-like pincers in order to grab food and move it into its mouth. It may develop an enhanced gut, allowing it to digest food more thoroughly. Being small in size, it will be a common target for Leshistoma and the like. To combat this, its eyes may move to be more along the top of its body, and when it detects a predator, it may burrow into the sediment to avoid detection. This creature's primary food source will be Microtraumastoma, but it may supplement its diet with Caliphosoma if there is substantial time between meals. It will have a lifespan of about 11 years. Catherostoma is what we will call this creature, for its cleaner mouth. Finally, we will move on to the depths of the ocean with three new creatures. The first will be another descendant of Scavabracid. This time, the Detritivore may lengthen its body a considerable amount, creating deep burrows that reach over a meter deep. Its sensitive tentacles may shorten to be very small, creating a denser neural network. This will make it more adept at detecting predators, and if it does detect a predator, it will retreat into its tunnel. The creature will develop hemolymph, the same kind of blood insects have on Earth, giving it a yellow color. At the end, it will grow a hook made from calcium phosphate, similar to panoplosoma. It will reproduce via broadcast spawning, as Scavabracket does, and its young will feed on carrion. This worm-like creature will live in all reaches of the ocean, but will be particularly fond of the abyss, as at this time, it is without life. In the abyss, it may grow to be even larger due to deep sea gigantism. If any part of its body is to detach, including its head, it will regrow that part. This creature may live indefinitely. As long as it has a majority of its body, it will continue to grow and thrive in the deep. This creature will be called Macrosoma, or Long Body. While Schizimabracid may find the Astrophilus canopy to be a suitable place to live, some may move to a new location due to Malophilus reducing Astrophilus numbers. In this case, it may relocate to the abyss, where there is little to no life and an abundant food source. With its razor-sharp claws, it will be able to slice bits of macrosoma for nourishment. Its clawed tentacles will shorten and curl, making it more hydrodynamic. The remaining tentacles will form webbing, which will also aid in its aquatic locomotion. Its eyes will become larger to take in more light, though it won't be very useful in the dark depths. Growing to be quite large due to deep sea gigantism, it will have no predators, for now, and may live up to 30 years or longer. We will name this creature Abyssazalia, or Abyss Swimmer. The final life form we will talk about today descends from Traumastoma. It too may find respite in the depths. This time, its mandibles may retract into the body until needed. This may be improved by making the motion as quick as possible. Having a trap jaw may be good for an ambush predator, but currently Traumastoma does not have a way to bring water over its gills without swimming. For this reason, the new evolution may open and close its mandibles while idle, forcing water into its mouth and through its gills. But this won't be enough for it to be a viable ambush predator. The final thing that it needs is something to lure in its prey. Since there is no light in the abyss, it may develop bioluminescence. 
A light will shine from the head of this creature, attracting a confused abyss azalea. When the time is right, the creature's trapped jaw will snap forward, grabbing its prey before retracting and swallowing it whole. With as large as Abyss Azalea is, and with its ability to remain idle, it will only need to feed once every week or so. This creature may live up to 60 years or longer. This creature will be called Pegidostoma, for its trap mouth. These evolutions take place over the course of 100 million years, bringing the timeline to 2.8 million years ago. In the next episode, we will cover the transition to land. If you're interested in seeing what kinds of creatures might evolve in future episodes, or have suggestions or ideas of your own, consider joining my Project Mira Discord server. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. I hope to see you there.